the majority of my gender identity is the divine feminine. Um, and then I have my masculine side. Y'all have met her. Or should I say him? Y'all have met him. Reminiscing on life is just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. The miseducation of Miss King Kinsey. Hey guys, welcome or welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is King Kinsey. I call my subscribers Kingpins. So if you want to become a Kingpin, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Hit that bell so you will be made aware first of when I drop my videos. And welcome, welcome, welcome to the first episode of my new series called The Kinsey Perspective, where we sit and we talk. <laughs> This can come in many forms. It is very much a talk series, it's giving very much podcast, but I'm not going to call it that yet. This will be the designated space where we have conversations about almost anything. So I would love to hear your thoughts um, on topics that you would like to just have a good old conversation about. You know what I'm saying? Kick your feet up, get your glass of wine, get your tea, get your spliff, get your whatever it is that you need to just come kick it and just have a real conversation for a minute. Okay. Anyways, guys, thanks for picking up my call and I hope you enjoy today's conversation. Today on the docket is a subject that I have been holding out for quite some time to speak about. It's been approximately a year and two months um, since this event occurred and I have been meaning to... Ooh, 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 ooh. Girl, this hair, this hair is greasy. Ooh, I need a wash. I had surgery on January 18th of 2023, and it was very much a life-changing, um, so to speak, surgery that affected me in many ways, and I'm one of millions of women that can relate to this surgery and the way that it makes them feel uh, pre- and post-operative. It's very hard to talk about. I've cried many, many, many tears. <laughs> I don't think I have any more to give and I definitely never want to be um, that vlogger on camera just crying her eyes out. And not that there's anything wrong with that. I just didn't want my channel to be that or about that. Um, but occasionally your girl's going to shed a tear. Just hopefully not today. I don't have the bandwidth <laughs> to cry. But anyway, um, I wanted to talk about this about two, three weeks ago, um, and I procrastinated as usual, and so here we are. <laughs> as a woman, I think this is very important to speak about. I feel like so many women can benefit from this conversation, could share our experiences, and just not feel alone with our thoughts, very much thoughts, that um, go through your head uh, when you have a surgery like this. Um, it puts into question a lot of primitive feelings that you aren't used to like thinking about necessarily. I don't know if that makes sense, but we'll get there. So I'm very much prepared because you know, ain't no way I'm talking about this. Ain't no way I'm talking about this. Not that I need a reason without a little split. So hopefully that won't bring the tears out because I have no time. I have no time for tears. And what better place to have this intimate conversation than in my intimate bedroom? I just felt like I want to hug my furry pillow. This is my like emotional coping mechanism for when I'm talking about uncomfortable subjects. So let's get started. I very much um, have some notes here because I wrote my thoughts down. I'm so proud of myself because you know, y'all know I can ramble with the best of them and I will and get lost somewhere in Timbuktu. So let me just stay focused. I've briefly talked about this um, in a disguised way. I talked about this in, um, I think, one of my blogs. I don't know which vlog it was, but I have um, talked or alluded to the fact that I had surgery last year. I just didn't say what. But I was very much talking about the female hormones and periods and yada, yada, yada. If you haven't guessed already, I am talking about a hysterectomy. So... I had a hysterectomy. I no longer have my lady parts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and I'm upset about it. No, it's fine. <laughs> I was very much one of those feelings I'm talking about. I was very, very upset about it um, for different reasons. So let's start from the beginning, okay? She very much started her period when she was 13. <laughs> TMI, but we're gonna go here, so let's go. I got my period when I was 13. Very normal flow. I didn't have any issues, you know. I was I was I was fresh. I was a spring chicken, very much virgin, very much just getting my period for the first time. So I'll never forget. Not that we need to go down that road, but I was very much one of those. I was like, oh, I'm grown. I'm a whole blossomed woman now. You know, she could have sex. She can get pregnant. I was very much a fast ass little girl. Let's just, let's just say that. Let's just keep it honest. Um, so getting my period, I thought was just this rite of passage to now be revered as a woman. And I couldn't have been further from anything. <laughs> it's just so hindsight is a bitch hindsight is a motherfucker like let me just say reminiscing on life is just like whoa 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 the miseducation of miss king kinsey let me look at my notes let me stay on track by the time i was a teenager um periods they did start to get a little heavier and more painful as time went on but still we're not talking about anything abnormal very much a regular period by the time i'm in my teenage years i did start birth control at the age of 16 so between 16 and 19 or 16 and 20 i noticed um just a big change in flow so i my periods got heavier and heavier and the strength of the birth control kept increasing um, to manage that. So fast forward to my mid-20s and uh, disaster strikes. So I was on birth control from the age of 16 and I did not get off until my early 30s, I want to say. See, dates very much matter. I want to say my early 30s. Yeah. 2018. Oh my God. I can't believe that came back to me. 2018 is when I stopped birth control. And in 2018, I was 34. So from 16 to 34, I was on birth control. Yeah. That's a very long time. So by the time I was in my mid to late 20s, when I tell you the pain that had manifested over time, my periods, I had moments of passing out. I had been hospitalized twice. Um, two of the times I passed out was at work and it was obviously because I was losing a lot of blood. Miraculously, I never hemorrhaged and I never needed a blood transfusion. Um, this is something that my mother went through and uh, my mother also had a hysterectomy in her 30s. Yeah, that part. So um, besides the heavy periods, I didn't think anything else was wrong. And I ugh, at least 10 times over the course of the last 20 years, um, I would bleed out. Like I'd be in my office chair at work in my cubicle or my office, wherever I was working at the time. And I would bleed out literally on my chair. That's, that's how bad it got. So between the high flow, the clots, the passing out, um, very low iron. Um, I just thought, you know, you have a heavy period. And when I would go to the hospital or when I would talk to my OBGYN about it, the answer was birth control. Birth control will help you not only not get pregnant, but it will help you regulate your period. So literally I would know the day and time my shit was coming. Like I knew my period was very, that's what birth control, that's what birth control does. My period was incredibly regulated and I appreciated that part, but there are a lot of hormones, um, in birth control. Um, estrogen being one of them. And, um, I found out later if we, it's, it's so hard to keep this, I took notes too, and I tried to keep it in order. Girl, let me go ahead and just light this up now because I can't keep my thoughts straight. There's just so many of them. And even though I wrote all this down, like, here's to trying. 
So, not that this is going to help, but every single OBGYN that I saw prior to my mid-30s told me that it was normal, um, told me that I just needed to go on birth control if that was something I needed anyway, which it was. You know, I'm a pansexual by definition. Um, and... You know, I didn't want, I didn't want to get pregnant. It's not something I've been married. I've been married for the last 20 years to a woman, a stud. We're very much non-binary, but that's a conversation for another time. Okay. But, um, pronouns aside, I have been with the same person for the last 20 years. And in terms of my sexuality, male, female, it don't matter. If I have a connection with you, we can go there. And I did not want to get pregnant, period, at the end. I did want my periods regulated and I wanted the heavy flows to stop. So when the OBs would offer birth control as the solution to my problem, I would gladly say, yes, I didn't understand hormones back then. We're talking, I'm young, like we're talking the early 2000s. I'm literally a brand new adult. You don't know the questions to ask. You just verbally vomit your symptoms and expect the medical professionals to do their fucking job. See? The anger. And I very much um, came up in the healthcare insurance industry. Um, that was my industry of choice, my profession of choice for 18 years until I quit my job and started doing this. <laughs> and... Um, I didn't know how important it was to be your own advocate, to be your own patient advocate. I didn't, I didn't realize how important that was until something was wrong with me and birth control wasn't cutting anymore. And 2018 was the year that I went vegan. I was vegan for two years. Um, and we had that conversation in some other vlog, one of the old vlogs too, but, um, no longer vegan, vegan-ish. <laughs> But lately, anyway, another topic, stay focused. So 2018 is when I stopped the birth control. That's when I called myself being enlightened about food and all this stuff. And I'm just like, I don't want any artificial, in, anything artificial in my body. I don't want any um, chemicals and preservatives and hormones and blah, blah, blah. I was just, I became very holistic circa 2018 and no longer wanted to take birth control. I have been married to a woman for years at that point. I'm like, why, why, why am I still taking this? Just to know when my period is coming. Let me see what my period is like without this. Well, the hormones in birth control feed a little something called fibroid tumors. And what I mean by that is fibroid tumors feed off the hormones that birth control puts out, puts into your body. So there are different Let's, so let's talk about fibroid tumors. There are different, I am not a medical doctor. Let me rewind. I am not a medical doctor. This is all research I've done and conversations I've had with medical professionals, my care team. Like this is all, you know, third hand knowledge. This isn't like, don't take my, I'm just telling you my story and what I went through in my experience. Okay. So go ahead and Google and like web MD yourself to death, but do not take my word as bond. Just telling you what I remember. Okay. Um, <laughs> disclaimers are necessary. Mm. Mm. All right. Ooh, you know that MJ. How your mouth spitting cotton. Okay. Now that I wet my thrapple. So fast forward to my mid thirties. Um, I'm off of birth control, 2018. My periods start getting worse, worse than they were. And that's saying a lot, like real bad. Um, to the point where I can't stay at work. I'm going to need you to focus. One thing I'm going to need you to do is focus. Okay. So we're in my mid thirties. She's a little older. She's a little wiser. 
I scheduled an appointment with my OB and I'm here to advocate for myself because I am absolutely crying for help at this point because my menstrual cycle is too painful for me to endure and I'm desperate at this point. So instead of, you know, I did research, but I didn't deep dive into research because I didn't have time. Um, work, busy as fuck. So I didn't have time. And I just thought, let me just talk to my OB and see what it is and just persist instead of being held responsible for asking questions I wouldn't know to ask. That's that's pretty much what happened my whole life. So the birth control regulated it for some time, but then of course it eventually stopped working and I had to do something to address the bleeding and the pain. Like I couldn't, it was excruciating, you guys. I don't even know how, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know how to describe the pain to, I can't, I can't. I mean, nothing, <laughs> I, I don't think anything is, as bad as labor, but I felt like I was giving labor to m little mini babies. <laughs> like, we're talking like plum size gross. Anyway, just I get a new OB. I, I go see her downtown and, um, <laughs> Unfortunately, she's incredibly dismissive. Um, she was incredible. This is when I was under Sutter and, um, I had great care under Sutter, but you know, there's always some. And, um, I was, you know, expressing, um, myself and what I've been going through. And there was just such a lack of like give fucks. That was the vibe I got from her. Like, yeah, yeah, your period sucks. I know everyone hates it. It is what it is. Like, stop complaining. What do you want? You want, you're not willing to go on birth control. You, um, at that time I had just started my new job, the one I, the one I quit to do this. <laughs> so I didn't have time to take, uh, <clears throat> time for surgery. I had just started. So I was like, I can't do that. Um, I didn't want to have surgery. I was very much into my fitness at the time. I mean, I am now, but I was like really into it then. That's when I like turned myself and my body around. So I didn't have time for the downtime that surgery would, would, um, impose. <clears throat> and so I was like, what can be done? I had read about ablations. Now, me and Bay decided that, um, and not decided because you changed through time and we've been together for 20 years. So we knew that kids weren't something that we really, like, it was always an option. It was more like, do you want kids? No. You want kids? No. All right. See you in five years. We'll ask each other again. And over the last 20 years, we've literally, we hit 20 years this year. Um, later this year, actually. So we're in year 19. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy to contemplate moving on. Um, but we have checked in with each other over the years with regards to children. And it's just not something we want to do. Like it's just not for reasons I don't need to go into. Um, even though I think it's the most beautiful thing, one of the most beautiful things, if not the most beautiful thing a human being, a woman can do like, I admire it. I think it's amazing. I think parenthood would be an amazing journey. I just, I don't know. I just would rather not. I don't know what else to say. I just, I don't want kids, even though I think I would be an excellent mother. Like, I think I would be an excellent mother for several reasons. Um, so for that reason, Bay and I have always said adoption is an option. So I don't, really have my body tells me my mind tells my body or in whichever order my body tells me that I want um to bear children that, that's that tick you get that time clock it's biological in women um and sometimes that pain can make you feel sad and because your body isn't doing what it's made to do and you just have that that yearning and longing and yada yada um and 
that aside, being with a woman, you can't have an accident. So, uh, most babies are conceived out of accidents, not mistakes, accidents. And, um, being, you know, a, a heterosexual couple that, that can easily happen, obviously, but we're not. So, you know, where two women can never be an accident, it's very much a discussion and a decision. So whenever we have those discussions, <laughs> the decision is always no. <laughs> and if, you know, or whenever we change our mind, um, we'll just adopt. So that's where we've left it and we're okay with that. So in talking to my OBGYN back then, she's very dismissive, very like, what do you want from me? You want an IUD? Let's do an IUD. She's, she tries to sell me on that because <clears throat> instantly, not let's do some x-rays, not let's do some ultrasound or, you know, whatever. Let's see what's going on in there and blah, de -ah. She says, let's, let's do the ID because you're not a candidate for ablation and never gave me the option of, um, what I found out later to be is an embolization, which is where they cut off the blood supply in your artery, um, <clears throat> that feeds your uterine walls blood to prepare for a child. So an embolization, um, an ablation, um, while an ablation, you will never be able to carry children, which I was okay with. Um, mind you, okay with meaning if I ever do change my mind and I want to bear kids and I'm within childbearing years, that is something I would have explored, but it's not like, oh my God, I can't do that because I want children. So I was never that assured and I was in pain and wanted it to stop. So the thought of burying my own child is something that makes me smile, um, but terrifies me. So I wasn't scared to give up that possibility, if that makes sense. Like it didn't scare me like, well, if I can't bear children, I can't bear children. I wasn't like bit on it anyway. And it's just hard to envision someone calling me mommy, like, and you're in charge and responsible for this little human being and you got to keep them alive and everything. Like just, I didn't want the responsibility of parenthood. Um, one of the things, and I didn't want to endure labor. I didn't want to endure bearing a child. It seems absolutely awful. And I know my body and I feel like this isn't going to go well. <clears throat> so anyway, several reasons as to why I or uh, Bay and I did, did or did not want children. She would never carry and you guys have met Tia, so I'm sure you can assume why. She would never carry. <laughs> she would make me do it because I'm the femme. Just, it is what it is. <laughs> anyway, we're probably going to adopt. I'm just saying, like, we're probably going to adopt. Anyway, so I see this OB. I'm a new patient. She says that an ablation isn't an option for you, for me, because um, my uterus is too big. Ugh. Of course, nigga. Of course, my uterus is too big. I will never forget the look on I, the look on my face. Like I can see myself. I will never forget how I felt in that moment. Like, bitch, what? My uterus is too big. Fuck you mean like my uterus that's so rude like no wonder i'm fucking hippie as fuck my uterus is massive apparently get the fuck out of here girl i'm getting ash everywhere like of course so immediately debts the ablation option because she's like your fucking uterus is too big it's done with some tool and it will be considered unsuccessful because uh, the tools are only manufactured up to a certain size and it's not going to fit in your big ass uterus. <laughs> never. I am scarred. I will never forget that. Well, turns out there was a reason why I had a big ass uterus. So, um, so she says IUD. So I'm like, fuck it. Fuck it. I didn't want anything inside of me, but I was desperate at that point, And I just did not 
want um, to deal with my periods anymore. With with the ablation, me bringing up the ablation was mainly because fuck having kids, bitch. I don't want no more periods. I don't want a period anymore. No I don't want a period anymore. No I do not want a period anymore. But I didn't want IUDs implanted in me. I didn't want um, I didn't want any of that because of the risk associated. And if it's gonna go wrong, it's gonna go wrong with me. I assure you. So I just didn't want anything up there. Well, she rolled out ablation, didn't tell me about embolization. Either way, these are all temporary um, solutions. Ablations, your lining can grow back. It often does. I have a good... Oh, I don't even want to say that. I have... Y'all already know I'm 39. I turned 40 this year. I'm actually really fucking excited, but story for another time. Anyway, um, I'm about... 20 years at 20, bitch, stop. 10 years out, 10 to 15 years out from menopause. So, um, yeah, I'd say 10 or 15 years, I'll be going into menopause at, at some time. And between now and then, if I were to get an ablation, if I were to get an embolization, um, so embolization is, like I said, cutting off the blood to your uterus. Um, the, other option was the ablation and then the other option was a myomectomy and that is for them to come in I don't know if they go in vaginally or through the belly button I don't remember but it was a myomectomy and they go in and surgically remove the fibroids because I ended up finding out that I have fibroids um on my second visit the one thing she did do was order the ultrasound and that's how we she found out um, I thought that that was a possibility because again, my mom had this, um, worse. Um, she like passed out blue, two blood transfusions, almost died, real fucked up situation in her thirties. I remember it. I was like in middle school. It was bad. Um, but yeah, so she had the same situation and, um, she got a hysterectomy because of it. Um, she kept her ovaries though. And Luckily, so did I. I have the biggest smile for that because <laughs> when I tell you I was incredibly thankful, like so thankful. I don't know in what order this, this conversation is going to be. <laughs> I need a fucking whiteboard or something because I have no clue the conversation. Like editing this is going to be a bitch. We're already almost an hour in and I'm not even halfway through the story. Oh, editing. Anyway, so. She presents these options to me. Ablation's out the question. I can't have downtime for surgery right now. I was like, absolutely not. I cannot not stop working. I'm going to get fat. <sighs> Myomectomy would have had a downtime of... I think she said somewhere between three and six months... I think more like six. I don't know. Like I could go back to work after three, but no working out for like six months. Some shit like that. But either way, I was like, no working out? Fuck no. Mm -mm, that ain't gonna work for me. And I just started a new, a new job. No. Um, ablation out the question. Uterus too bad. <laughs> Fuck me. And what was the other one? Um. Oh, IUD. And I'm just thinking, fuck, no. She's like, I really think this is going to be a solution for you. I really, And I'm just sitting here like, this is going to be a problem. I just fucking knew it. She wasn't listening. Okay, Linda wasn't listening. So she gives me the IUD right then and there, y'all. Right then and there. First and last time. First and last time. I, when I tell you that shit hurts so goddamn bad, that shit hurts so goddamn bad. And I was on my period. Mm. Mm. And she's like, well, it's better that you're on your period because it's going to, you know, be a little bit more comfortable. Like, cause you're like super like what down there, like <laughs> you're wet, it's blood. You're just gushy as fuck. So, um, it won't hurt as much, bitch. Stop lying. Why Craig? Why you got to lie? Like that shit hurts so bad. Oh, I'll never forget that. That shit hurts so bad. It's relatively quick, but not quick enough. So I'm like, I'm already feeling like mm, that shit didn't go in right. Something's wrong. That hurt way too. <laughs> Something's wrong. Y'all. 
when I tell you this, y'all gonna throw up. So, y'all, ladies, ugh, I hope the ladies I'm reaching have had hysterectomies. I mean, I don't wish that upon anybody, but this conversation will hit for those that can re And I know there are millions of you. So this is why I'm doing that video. I just have to like remind myself that this is why I'm talking about this. You guys, I'm a very, if I haven't said already, I'm a very private person. So my decision to become a vlogger, I don't know how I got here. <laughs> I don't know how I know, but, but at the same time, I'm like, this is hard for me and it's bringing me out of my shell and I'm getting there and I'm enjoying the ride for the most part. Um, but yeah, this was needed to talk about this. Again, not that I need an excuse, but this is hard. Ooh, wee, this is hard. And I'm about to show y'all some shit. You're going to be like, say what? Anyway, all my late 30s, girlies, 40s, 50s. If you have had a hysterectomy, girl, I feel you. And the way they used to perform these procedures back in the day. Oh, I feel you. I feel you. I am lucky from that perspective. Anyway, none of those options were options for me. Um, and with the exception of the IUD. So that's why I got it same day. And that shit was just horrible. But fast forward, I want to say it was about eight to like 10 months, not quite a full year, but about eight to 10 months after I got the IUD. When I tell y'all, not only were my periods incredibly turbulent, incredibly turbulent, in the months that followed, um, after I got the IUD. Um, and I called, I called in about it several times and they said that it's normal and it's uh, probably going to cause more bleeding the first time. And then I'll slowly start to see that like in about a year's time, you won't even have a period anymore is what they were telling me. Um, and if you do, it'll be mild uh, spotting because eventually, you know, the hormones start getting released and the IUD is implanted and it's there and it's in your system for a while, you know, and you gain, you know, that resistance. So eventually you're not even going to have a period anymore. Bitch, that eight to 10 months, the most excruciating, bloody, just the worst periods you could imagine. And I was like bedridden up between heating packs, a ton of painkillers, the bed to the, to the toilet, to the couch, to the bed, like just horrible horror for like four days. It's the first four days. Cause I would bleed for like a whole two weeks. My periods would go on for weeks, like just four or five days, just misery, absolute misery. Um, even before the IUD and now the IUD is making it worse and they're just reassuring me, oh, this is all going to clear up and blah, de -de -de. and then one fine day I'm in the shower and cleansing myself down there and I feel something and I'm like, what the fuck is that? I feel like a wire. And I'm like, okay, I know my pubes are not that coarse. I know my <laughs> That's what I remember thinking. I know my pubes are not this coarse. And what the fuck is that? And it's kind of like towards like my hole. So I'm like, what the fuck is that? So I get to look in, get out the shower. And I'm just like all like in the mirror. And I'm like, what the fuck? And I call Bay in because I can't take it no more. And I'm in so much pain and I'm bleeding so bad. And, um... <laughs> to make a long story short, I ended up on my back in the bed and I mean, we're lesbos and we can do this. I mean, we're very familiar with each other and we're like best friends and lovers. So it's like the best of both worlds. And it was like, Bay took over. Okay. She was not playing. She couldn't have me hurting like that. So she literally took over. It was like, psh, open up mm, in there. And so gently, I love you. I love you. Anyway, and um, very gently, and while I was like hysterically crying, um, she was just being incredibly gentle and literally like slowly guided her hand in there, cuffed her hand around the IUD and 
pulled it out just ever so slowly where it wasn't catching on any walls or anything else. She was just making sure it wasn't connected to anything so that it wouldn't pull on anything. And it took her about less it, less than three minutes to, to maneuver around to get it out safely and whole. Um, because me feeling the wires means that it fell, it dropped because my periods are so turbulent. Side note, when I did go, she told me, the OB told me that the chances of me having, um, endometriosis or adenomyosis were high. She thought more particularly would be adenomyosis because um the pain is very focused it's very pinpointed like it, it's in a certain area and it's concentrated in that area the pain is excruciating endometriosis it kind of <laughs> endometriosis it um spreads over your entire abdomen so it's more of a all over pain, not a localized pain, if I'm making any sense. So, um, she thought the chances of me having adenomyosis and fibroid tumors, um, were high. It was just a matter of, um, how large are the fibroids? And what kills me is... I had already had a pap smear and I didn't want another one. So we didn't need to do that, but she could have like gotten her hands up, th up there and felt around her a little bit. She didn't do that. Not at all. She just was there to put the IUD in. And, um, anyway, so yeah, the IUD came out, girl. It came out, it came out violently. And like, I knew it would, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. And what's funny is when she opened me up, she was like, oh, you really are a heavy bleeder. Bitch, I'm trying to tell you. Go over here. Anyway. So, second visit, she... Because I was in so much pain with the IUD, I went in with a second visit before it fell out. <clears throat> and so, she's like, okay, let's do the ultrasound. That's when I find out we have, I have the fibroids. And, um... So, this is the killer part radiology results come in and I in fact have fibroids and um they're massive okay talking to you they're massive and I don't know that they're massive in that moment because my results were just sent to the portal where I can view them and decipher them for myself. I did receive a call and it was explained to me that I have fibroid tumors, um, but they did not go over the size of those tumors. I actually went onto the portal to see that, to look for that, to see what the sizes were. The embolization, the ablation, not a candidate. Embolization is temporary. I wanted something more permanent. That was my thing. And I thought the ablation was the answer until found out I got a rather large uterus and that is why that's what I forgot to say that is why I had an enlarged uterus was because I had these massive fibroid tumors riddled throughout my uterus now I did not realize the size of them at the time of the ultrasound when she gave me the results because she didn't go over the size they weren't detrimental to it it wasn't like it was detrimental to my health like an emergency like oh these got to come out it, it was just more of you know they're they're a good size and you know they can be the cause you know for sure they're increasing your bleeding and causing discomfort um and you know either you can stay with the i you can continue the course with the iud and just have eventually very low flow periods and you know get you to a state where you can withstand your period um, if, you know, birth control is not an option and yada, yada, yada. So then of course, as you know, the IUD falls out and then I'm like, what the fuck? I call them back and I'm just like, this didn't work for the reasons that I thought. And I bleed too heavy for this. Like it was bound to be pushed out and I have fibroids. So I have, I've had enough of that OB. I change it. 
Okay. So, but before I do that, I just endure it for like another year and I'm just like, fuck it. I just know that I'm going to be fucked up. And at this point, like I'm working at, um, from home often. And then COVID happened. So then it was, you're working from home permanently and it made it a little bit more bearable to sustain my periods because I was at home. And even though it was still ridiculous. <laughs> so like, I'm just like, no, I can't do that. A couple of years go by. I'm just like, I can't have surgery. I can't do this. I can't do this. And then, um, I get to the point obviously where I left my career, my old profession behind. I quit my job and I'm like, I'm moving on. So Meanwhile, I'm, I'm still enduring these excruciating periods monthly and I bleed for like two weeks, <laughs> literally. And then I have one week to myself and then the next week I'm, I'm back at it with premenstrual symptoms. And so I really only had one week of the month to like be okay. And it was just not okay. And I couldn't take it anymore. So Bay and I, you know, had a conversation and it was very much, it went very much a lot like, you have to have a hysterectomy. That's just where we're at. Let's get on the phone. Let's get another OB and get um, a second opinion and all of that jazz. So I find a new doctor and she is heaven sent. Like she's just so knowledgeable and so patient and tells me everything I need to know without having to ask questions that I wouldn't necessarily know to ask and just walk me through the whole thing. And it was just refreshing as fuck and just gave me the full picture, including what causes fibroids. And I had Googled this before, like, I'm not stupid. Like I've looked into, into all of this and fibroids, while it's undetermined, like medically, fibroids are caused by a very different things. Your diet, all these chemicals and um, processed foods and all like all this shit. Our diet is a factor. Definitely in some way is feeding fibroids, birth control. Um, and <sighs> this part, hair relaxers, chemical hair treatments that have formaldehyde in them. And I'm talking like, I mean, I got my hair relaxed for years, as early as seven, all the way to now, 2021. Recently, I put a relaxer in my hair and that's what's at the ends here that still hasn't grown out yet. But chemicals, hair chemicals. Um, I used to get keratin treatments. I used to get Brazilian blowouts, chemicals, chemicals, chemicals. So that diet, birth control, like, causes these abnormal, um, dense tissue to grow inside and around your uterus. And it's incredibly painful. So then she proceeds to tell me that, well, I wish she was like, they've probably gotten, you know, bigger in the last couple of years, but it can't be like that much. And she's like, let me look at the record. She pulls up the lab results she, or the radiology results. And she's like, I, what I thought was millimeters was like centimeters. And she'll, she's like, your largest one is like grapefruit size. And then you got like an orange a plum, a walnut over here. I'm like, bitch, <laughs> what? So she goes up inside me and she's like, look here, you feel this? And she's counting them. And I'm just so taken back at how thorough she is in her examination and how she's communicating it to me. And I'm just like, what? I just totally misread. I went onto the portal and read it myself and I mis mistook the measurements and the nurse didn't go into detail. It was just like, they're not life-threatening. It's more of a choice. You can't do surgery right now. You can't, uh, ooh, it just gets me so emotional thinking about it. You know, you can't have an ablation. Your uterus is too big. You can't have surgery uh, because you can't have downtime. The IUD didn't fell out, girl. Like, nothing's working. And um, even when I would go to the ER, like, 
the two times I was hospitalized for losing a shit ton of blood, like, and I was in so much pain, so Bay called 911, like, this was in my early 20s. Like, just so many stories of just things that, you know, unnecessarily didn't have to, just, just so much, so much, so much, and not enough at the same time. And even when I was hospitalized, you know, there was never any, you know, radiology that was done, that was ordered. They literally just left me in the hall, gave me pain meds, and there was no, um, you know, no spectrum going in. There was, there was no examination. There was, there was nothing. It was just like, here's some stronger shit and wait till this subsides and go home. And you don't know what, especially in the ER, like it's fucking chaos in the ER. So it's just, you're just sitting there. Like, I don't, I don't know what to do. And again, I was young. So now pff, nothing gets past me. Nothing. A bitch is almost 40. Like I've lived. Nothing gets past me. I'd be on that ass <laughs> with everybody. Like, I got here. When I was in the hospital, I mean, like you just, you don't know what to ask them to do. You're just telling them, you're answering their questions and telling them your symptoms. And, you know, they're not even offering, like I could have found out I had fibroids a long ass time ago. Like I didn't need to wait that. I didn't need to find out in my, they've been growing this entire time. I would have, I could have, and I would have made better choices and decisions in terms of my diet, hair relaxers, getting off birth control sooner. Nobody give a flying fuck. And then there's the element of being, colored. Okay. I'm a person of color. I'm black and white. So there is the element of the disregard for the mixed or black woman. There's a disregard there because your life is less valued. So it's not as much of a panic. They don't give as many fucks because your the value of your life through their lens is less than theirs. And that's the harsh reality. So they don't tend to listen to us. They just see, they're forced to see you and they're like, here, you know, here's some, they, they don't, they're not listening to you, but young ones look, and the young ones today, much more advanced because they had social media, they had phones, they had this, they had that, the newer generation, much more advanced. However, not all. So Young ones, ask questions, ask questions, ask questions, period, dot, the end. Give them your symptoms, ask questions, Google the fuck out of everything. You'll be fine. But in my day, it was a little different. It just was a little different. Anyway, and had I not worked in the healthcare industry, I wouldn't have even known to ask certain questions to like as I got older and in that industry, your proximity to that terminology and the processes in the healthcare industry and how it all works, um, my knowledge grew. And once that grew, I knew how to, how to navigate. I knew how to deal with these professionals. I know how to talk to them. I, I know their contracts. I know like I, once you got in my career, I gained that knowledge. I'm older, I'm wiser. I figured shit out. Just know to always ask questions and advocate for yourself because I was very much this girl right here in the ER. Shout out to her for making this real. Y'all, look at this. What brings you in today? I'm having a lot of bleeding. Are you on your period? Yes, but it's not like any other period I've had before. Why do you think that? I know that this is the sixth day of my period, so usually I'm spotting, but instead I'm bleeding through two pads an hour and I'm dizzy and I'm in so much pain that I've been throwing up from it all day. Well, I don't really know what I can do for menstrual pain in the emergency room. Did you try taking Tylenol? Yeah, of course I took Tylenol before I came to the ER, but it didn't touch the pain. So you want pain medicine? What do you want me to do about this? I want an ultrasound so that you can check for cysts and fibroids and fallopian tube and ovarian torsion. I want you to ask about my family history so that you can understand that there has never been a woman in my family who's made it to age 50 with her uterus. I want you to ask if I've ever been diagnosed with endometriosis. I want you to ask if I've had any previous abdominal surgeries. I want you to ask if I could have possibly been pregnant to assess whether or not this was perhaps a miscarriage. I want you to test me for things like Hashimoto's and Von Willebrand's disease, which could cause excessive bleeding. I want you to ask if I've had an IUD and whether or not that could have caused a tear. 
I want you to ask everyone any medications that could cause excessive bleeding like Warfarin or Lovenox. I want you to check on my iron levels. I want you to treat me like a patient who showed up to the emergency room not with a hangnail, but with pain so bad that they could barely move. So you don't want pain medicine? Of course I want painkillers, I'm in pain. But I also want to make sure that when I leave here and I can't see a gynecologist for at least a week, that we know that we didn't miss anything critical or dangerous. Fine, if you're gonna be hysterical. That reel she made was super informative and very much a reenactment of how things went uh, or should have gone for me had I known how to advocate for myself in that kind of atmosphere. So when I saw that on Instagram, I was like, <laughs> story of my life like women's health it's it's come a long way but y'all it is very much a man's world men wouldn't have this problem if it were a problem for them it is very much a man's world so advocate for yourself if you're a woman and especially if you are a woman of color is you will be ignored don't be naive. Anyway, so she gives me the lo the the lowdown with the real size of my fibroids, and I'm just blown back, like, huh? And she's like, all this, you feel this right here, and she's having me touch myself. I was, I'm thinking that's like, what do they call it, visceral fat, like trapped fat or whatever the fuck. Like, I'm thinking it's, you know, from being obese and doing all the weight loss journey. I'm thinking it's just fat that I can't get rid of. It's stuck there unless I have procedures. Um, and while I very much, I, I very much have a fupa, there was a hard bulge behind the fat that I thought was just fat and it wasn't. It was almost nine pounds worth of tumors. You heard me right. I have pictures. I'm going to show you guys this in a minute, but I'll save that for last because whoa quite a a bit of mass <laughs> we're talking mass um inside of me and it made so much sense other symptoms that i've had you know gas bouts and um certain aches and pains the bulge in my lower belly that i thought was just my fupa <laughs> to the 10th power like no it was fibroid tumors my violent menstrual cycles everything that I was experiencing for years just suddenly all made sense because she took the time to explain it to me give me the actual results because if I'm left to decipher all this shit like it, it's written in like the matrix like <laughs> have you ever seen a radiology like report like fuck you're like what the fuck does this mean <laughs> and i really thought i thought something said mm something said mm like i thought it said millimeters and turns out it was centimeters like yeah and she's thinking i probably have adenomyosis but like i said the only way they could diagnose that is if they go in with the myomectomy and you know laparoscopically and see what's going on in so by this time, I'm like, yeah, Bay and I have decided a hysterectomy needs to happen. I'm not worried about taking time off because I quit my job. <laughs> so I'm just like, all right, let's do this. You know, fuck it. I wasn't excited about the downtime and my OB, which I think I've talked to you guys about this. But oh, yeah, I didn't tell you what the surgery was, but I was telling you I'm like super bummed because I gained 30 pounds. I think I said it on the last vlog. Um, and, um, she warned me, that's the surgery, the hysterectomy. She warned me like, you're more uh, susceptible to gaining weight for, I don't know. It has something to do with hormones. I don't know. Um, and I very much did. I very much did gain 30 pounds over the course of last year, girl. And, um, and then there was the fact that I was anemic for years and had no idea. <laughs> no idea. So in preparation for it, three months prior to, they put me on Lupron, which is a hormonal injection to induce menopause and um, essentially shrink 
um, the tumors as much as possible before surgery to make them even easier to get out. It stops your period. It flings you into early uh, menopause. So it, and when that happens, because once you get to menopause, my fibroids, everything would have stopped. Everything, they would have shrinked. They would have been non-existent. Fibroids are fed by blood. And the Lupron was to stop that. So, because I said I had 10 to 15 years before um, going into menopause, which would have taken my cares away. You know what else it did? You see that right there? Y'all see that? That right there. Need some water. This right here. This little this little ball. This little motherfucker right here. Y'all see that? Some kind of like. It's not a sty. It's not a sty. It's like a heart. It's a mineral deposit. This is what I found out. It's a mineral deposit, and it showed up. I got that Lupron shot three months before my surgery to fling me into menopause and I went through the worst, the worst hot flashes. I had hot flashes like every fucking 30 minutes and I would race to the door just to get outside because it was, um, yeah, winter 2023. When I tell y'all, the moment I got that hormonal shot, that injection, that Lupron, within a matter of hours, this popped up. Okay, this right here, that's still here. I thought it'd be gone by now. It's literally a mineral deposit and the Lupron did it. The Lupron did it. It's very much a thing. The Lupron did it. What else? Oh, I had to get an MRI, which hurt like a motherfucker, like trying to get up. It, the MRI doesn't hurt. You're just laying on your back flat. Um, or whatever position they put you in. I was on my back. And um, not only are you in this confined space with this alarming sound going off, that part I can get past, but you're on the table for like 40 fucking minutes. And you, I had an IV and they had to do the contrast or whatever. And um, it's cold. Like it makes you cold. When you're sitting on the table, your back just starts hurting. I'm just, bitch, I'm almost 40. The fuck? I can't lay on my back and expect to like get up okay. <laughs> For 45 minutes? Lay on my back for 45 minutes? No, no. So I was paralyzed when they were like, okay, you're all done. You can go, blah, blah, blah. Oh my God. Oh my God, I need to switch sides. Oh my God. Oh, oh, I feel like my hip just popped. So I didn't have a period and that part was great. Let me tell you, as far as I was concerned, that shit was out. Everything was kind of smooth sailing up until that point, And then I had the surgery and girl, when I woke up, <sighs> y'all, when I woke up from that surgery, I was scared because one, we didn't know, we didn't know for sure if they were going to have to take my ovaries because my, um, if I did have endometriosis and it was riddled throughout, she could have had to take my ovaries. Um, she thought also that likelihood was not that and that I have adenomyosis. She ended up confirming that after the fact. I'll show you the pictures in a minute. She ended up confirming that I didn't have, in fact, have that uterine lining disease, um, adenomyosis, and almost nine pounds worth of tumors that had, that was in the process of being shrunk by the Lupron. So they were bigger prior to getting the hormonal injection, which is crazy to contemplate, but fuck. And, um, yeah, so there was a chance she would have to take my ovaries, but she made sure to tell me she was going to do everything she could to make that not the case. And I was very, I am very thankful that she kept her word and I have my ovaries. My ovaries are very much there. So I can also, if I choose to, if my eggs are still good and I can have a surrogate, like it, you just, there's options now. So you never know. It could be adoption. It could be surrogacy. Who knows? But taking my ovaries would have flung me into a hormonal mess immediately. Ooh, this hair. Immediately I would have been in uh, menopause and that would have been a travesty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so... um. I was terrified because I knew in that moment 
when it came, well, let me back up. When um, it came to the type of surgery, like how they were going to get it out, there was the lathos lathoscopic way. Um, there was the traditional route, which is the cutting into, but that's only if they could get it out. They couldn't get it out badly. So what I had was the V-notes procedure. The V-notes procedure is the most minimally uh, invasive way. It's it's the tumors are removed vaginally, um, but how they do it, there's actually a simulation on YouTube that I looked up and that's what I watched prior to surgery. And I was like, bitch, mm, you make me want to fight you. If you would have, Ooh, I can't. Mm. When I watched that, I was just like, Oh no, I'm not doing this. I changed my mind. <laughs> I changed my mind. I was just kidding. I was just kidding. I was just kidding. I was just kidding. I'm gonna go ahead and run that right now. Check this out. Is what happened to me. I have no recollection because I was put to sleep. But this is what happened to me. Girl. Okay. So when I woke up from surgery, what the variables were, do you have your ovaries? Were, did they have to cut into you? Because she said your, <clears throat> your fibroids are so big, so big that it may, well, she said, I've seen worse cases. She's like, you're not like, oh my God, you know, they're big, but I've seen worse. Like, she's like, she said she had seen women who've had fibroids grow right into their fucking rib cage. Damn. Like the pain, the pain of it all. I'm not, I wasn't that bad, but I was bad. Um, so yeah. And the Lupron, like I said, was shrinking it by the time we got to surgery. So it was probably fucking 10 pounds. All I know, it was a lot. Let me show you bitch. Get ready. Okay. Warning. Disclaimer. The images I'm about to show you are incredibly graphic. I can't believe I'm sharing this, but full transparency. Women, this is for y'all. Mm. I'm like very much on my phone and I don't want my gimbal to. <sighs> okay. Girl, look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Do you see that mass, that th the mass of masses? Do you see my guts on the operating table? Like, do you see that? That is insane. That is ins like, all of that was inside me, you guys. Like, I can't even fathom it. First of all, do you see what looks to be like a whole artery right there? That's a fibroid. That's a fucking fibroid. That's the grapefruit size one she was referring to. That one that was all up in my gut that I would feel the most pain, which was, if I remember correctly, on my left side, or was it my right? I don't remember. But when I was having my periods where the most pain would be concentrated, it was around that big motherfucker. Look at the mass. All of that is uterus chopped and screwed, cervix chopped and screwed, and a whole ton of fibroid tumors chopped and screwed. And one in intact, like crazy, insane, 
And then here, this surgery changed me. This, sur I mean, the only other surgery I've ever had is a tonsillectomy of and two rhinoplasties. I told y'all about that. That'd be story time for another time. I said that then, but now that I've launched this new series, the Kinsey Perspective, we can talk about it here. Stay tuned. So yeah, I tonsillectomy, two rhinoplasties, um, this and wisdom teeth. I'm literally going to have this framed. I'm keeping these pictures. I asked her for these pictures because I wanted to see what had been ruining my life for years. Like what had, had been just had me in so much pain and the mass. Here are my ovaries. Look at that. That is insane. That is insane. She put a roller next. That's hilarious. She put a whole ruler next to it. But that's insane. Those are my ovaries. So she was like, yeah, first of all, that looks like that on a chicken. My ovaries are intact. Okay. I was very happy. Very happy. So surgery's over. Went well. It ran, um longer than expected because she said there was so much as you just saw. She was like, there was so much and it just kept coming. Her exact words. <laughs> um, she said she spoke to me the first time, but I didn't even remember a single conversation I had with her because of the anesthesia, which is normal. Um, but then after she came in the room, um, and talked to me and she was like, yeah, surgery went very well. It just was incredibly long. Something like, it was over six hours um, because it took them so long to get it out. So the V-notes procedure, she was like, it went well. They were able to get it out vaginally. They had to chop and screw it as you saw to do that, but they did. But when I woke up, I would just, I had a panic because um, I had to, you know, look, reach down and look and see whether or not I, they were able to get it out. Cause if they weren't able to get it out, they were going to have to cut into me, which would have been even more of a downtime and healing from a major cut like that, just with cesareans, like you're cutting through the tissue and the muscle. And I was like, fuck my life. Like, ugh, and then I'm going to be scarred and like, fuck. So, um, I was very, I was keeping my fingers crossed, hoping that they would get it out vaginally and the venous procedure, which I found out was a relatively, um, new thing, like in terms of regular practice, they actually had someone there that oversaw it. Um, there was another doctor, one of the OBG ones, OBGYNs that I saw, um, prior to the one that performed the surgery, she assisted on the surgery because she wanted to see, she wanted to be a part of it because, um, the V notes procedure is relatively new and, um, it was, you know, experience for her and the people who, uh, create the device for the V notes procedure, um, there, they were watching. I had to sign a whole consent form for them to observe it because they want to watch and make sure that the device is being used properly to perform the surgery. So that was kind of cool. Just know, I felt like it was an episode of house where they're up in there watching your guts and blah, 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 all this. <laughs> it was just like, oh wow. They really like the medical profession. Like they really do. Anyway, but, um, when I looked down, I remember, I remember like breathing for the first time and it hurt. And I was like, oh, bitch, <laughs> don't breathe, hold your breath. And then I looked and I realized I didn't have a cut. Um, I realized I didn't have a cut and I immediately just had a sense of relief, just fucking relief. Like, oh, God, I tried to move and it was just like, it was moving. My core was incredibly painful, but I had to pee. And let me tell you, I went through the worst, like, gas bout like it was so fucking painful and um i had like a dream team like filipino nurse um and um her like she was teaching him a trainee of a, another nurse um and they were great but when they left i had this one girl who didn't give a fuck about nothing didn't come to nothing didn't do nothing like i it was in the day because the dream team came at night they were the best. They were the best. She taught me how to cough. Like she was like, put the pillow here. You got to hold it tight. Um, it's going to hurt at first. And I'm like, oh, bitch. Like I was so scared. I was so scared. And I was like, ah, ah, ah. and then when I felt that pain, when I actually had an actual cough, I was like, oh, I'm never coughing again. <laughs> never in life. Don't ask me to do it again. <laughs> oh, that was painful. I couldn't walk. Like the moment I stood up my feet, I couldn't walk. 
it's like I couldn't feel. I mean, they just fell up on it. Like I could not walk. And that was like crazy to me. I'm like, bitch, like you're really just like one minute you have control of all your fucking functions. And apparently my legs were in the fucking stirrups like this for so goddamn long that I lost all function. My legs were like jello. It's like they weren't even there. It was fucking crazy. And that didn't help for when I had to get up and take a fucking shit, which I was scared as fuck to do because of the pain. And then like the gas and like, girl, girl, it was horrible. It was horrible, but the dream team got me, got me through it. Those two Filipino nurses, like, I don't know y'all name. Shout out to y'all. Y'all got me through it. But that other nurse, bitch, take a hike. Like, fuck. You need to quit. Because obviously you don't like your job. You need to quit. You need to quit. You are a whole nurse fucking with people's lives. You need to quit. Anyway, I got to keep my ovaries. And that is, let me tell you, the relief. That's what came next. The relief. The sweet relief knowing that I was not going to be in pain anymore. I wasn't going to have a single period. Not to mention when I lifted the co the covers to see what lied beneath, like was there an incision or, you know, whatever. Once we got past that and I felt on my lower fupa and I realized that there was no bulge behind it. Like there's very much still a fupa, but there was no bulge behind it. Like the hard bulge that it was gone and my stomach for that reason was flatter i'm not gonna tell you my stomach but when i look in the mirror now and i look at my stomach i'm like holy shit i was like i i gained weight yes after the surgery but before i fucking i had no idea like so much of it wasn't fat like the difference was night and day my stomach is flat like you can you can see my fupa but you can tell that like i could have passed for like four months pregnant the blow that everything was gone so the the cloud of relief and just this is over this is over this is over there's no more pain there's no more it's over the relief, the relief, the sweet relief. Like I was so happy. I was so happy. And then I was sitting on my ass for three months. Couldn't do shit. It's fun as fuck gaining weight. It's hard to look back at yourself later. Like, but when I tell you the, the sweet relief, like I was on my, <laughs> I was on my ass eating, didn't have a care in the world, just sitting here eating healing okay i'm getting my rest i'm licking my wounds i was just like finally at peace knowing that this was over now i bled for like ever because i had surgery your reason as to why you're having a hysterectomy may be different from mine mine was a medical issue that i no longer could deal with and yours may be something different but the majority of the time hysterectomies are medically necessary because they're causing complications. If this is a surgery you are contemplating, I hope it is because it will bring you much relief as it did me. And for that reason, I am incredibly thankful. Incredibly thankful. Um, but it has its adverse effects and um, I very much wanted to talk about those as well. I was just so happy and then eventually I got restless because I couldn't do anything and it was starting to get to me and then the depression kicks in you know those intrusive thoughts you're getting fat you're not going to the gym you're it's going to be like you're starting over and just blah. like it's just um there's a lot of thoughts and then the darkest thoughts um and I'll keep this quick because it's not something I really want to recant because again, it has its emotional ramifications and I am not in the mood to cry. And, um, yeah. So all that baby talk while being a mother, yes, that just sounds great. And then not at the same time, but I am very much a female, um, by sex and by most of my gender identity. And, being, even if you don't necessarily want to, having the ability or being still in the age range where you very much can, very much fertile, okay, very much fertile, you can very much have a child. There is that um, option that is taken away from you, regardless of your feelings of motherhood. Like it's taken away from you because you, you quite frankly don't have any 
choice um, unless you want to endure this bullshit until menopause. And um, I didn't want to go through pain anymore and I didn't want 10 pounds of tumors just hanging out in my guts. So um, I couldn't take it anymore. But then also a part of me felt like the dark thoughts, this is where it comes in, is um, you're less than, you're less than, you're less than, you're less than female because having a period every month reminded you very abrupt, uh, very abruptly, very disrespectfully, um, that you're a female and only females will understand this. It's very much a feeling. It's your hormones. Um, it's your sexual organ. Your mind to body connection is very much, I'm female and these are my female organs and your biology is who you are on a primitive level is in your DNA. I felt less than a female. I felt like the opportunity, I felt like my option had been taken away from me and I felt less of a female for it. I felt like, I don't know. I felt less soft. I don't know how to, I mean, I know how to articulate it, but I felt less soft. I felt less feminine. I felt less, felt less. And I struggled with that part very very bad. Um, and I still have my moments now, but, and then if Bay and I, you know, did decide, like, even though I didn't want to bear children, the thought that I can't, it just fucks with you somehow. I hope this is making sense. All I can explain is how I felt it. And I know it's perfectly normal to feel these, this way. Um, it's a thing. Having the option of motherhood, having the option of bearing your own children taken away from you, even though it's something that you think you don't want, it affects you mentally. It, there's, it makes you feel like you are, um, less than a woman, less than a whole woman. I'll say that. Like I'm very much, you know, woman, you know, hear me roar all of that. I'm very much her. Okay. The majority of my gender identity is the divine feminine. Um, and then I have my masculine side. Y'all have met her. Or should I say him? Y'all have met him. And then, um, but the majority of me is female. Hence, you know, non-binary, pansexual. I'm very smack in the middle of the spectrum. In regards to my sex, very much femme. Yeah. Very much femme, very much... <laughs> and I felt less than. I felt less soft. I felt less feminine. And that those feelings just make you feel ick. They make you feel like, like, who are you? And it's dark. It's dark. It's a dark feeling. And, um, I look at birth now, like I've, I've seen labor, I've, you know, seen it in person and I've seen it on TV. And whenever that, whenever birth is, whether I see it in a vlog or I see it, you see it in movie. Whenever I see it, a part of me dies a little bit, even though that is nothing I wanted to experience a part of me because I don't have the option to experience that if I wanted to, I just, you feel like you have this gaping hole in your pelvis, like nothing's there, boo. <laughs> nothing's, I mean, my ovaries are there. They took the fallopian tubes as well. Like everything's gone except my ovaries. And then in, in a way you're just kind of like, and then the next you're like, what if I want it to? What if, could you imagine like feeling, you know, the heartbeat and growing a human being in your belly? And like, I think it's fascinating. I think it's absolutely fascinating and terrifying. It, it's all the feelings, you know, pregnancy, labor, motherhood, it's all the feelings. And it's a feeling that I'm not going to experience. And while I'm okay with it, Sometimes I'm not okay with it. And that's the feeling I'm talking about. To all my girlies that have had this experience or will have this experience, I really hope that this conversation reaches you. It's been real. It's been great having this conversation with you guys. Um, let me know in the comments if you enjoyed the video, what your favorite part was. If you have any questions, ask. I would be happy to answer them um, from my perspective. 
Thank you so much for tuning in to the Kinsey Perspective, the first episode. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button, give this video a like, and share it if you feel like it was helpful or it could be helpful to someone else. We've been on the phone for like two, almost two and a half hours. With that being said, bye. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye. Stay tuned for the next one.